Welcome to the John Freakin' Muir Pod. Lace up those boots and sling on the pack for a romp through trails, short and long. With your host and renaissance man, Doc, it's time to embrace the suck. Welcome back to another week on the trail. I'm Doc, and this is the John Freakin' Muir Pod. Let's start off with that reminder. If you are enjoying the podcast, take just a minute, help us out, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, and... If you're not enjoying the pod, well, just go ahead and keep that to yourself. All right, let's get to this week's guest, whom I think our listeners are really going to enjoy. Not only is he a triple crowner, but he completed the triple crown with a southbound hike of the PCT this year. He has a fantastic YouTube account, and he's got one of the best nicknames I have ever encountered. Welcome to the John Freaking Muir Pod, Jack Jones. Hi, uh, happy to be here. Now, where are, you, where are you calling in from? So I'm coming in from Missouri which has not been terrible this winter. It's been 60s and 70s here. Usually it's just gray and cold and nasty. So. Okay. Pretty mild winter out there. Nice. Yeah, it really has been. Yeah, it is raining right now in Southern California. So I apologize to our listeners if you can hear the, wa- the rain beating against the window in the studio here. But uh, we'll just have to put up with that. Perfect. Oh, and then one little correction. I, so I haven't finished my triple crown yet. I have my California and Oregon left to do. I started southbound this year. I did Washington and then all the fires. So I got kicked off and then, you know, did all the other stuff. So almost there. I'll oh, duly noted. Year. Okay. All right. Very good. I want to take credit for things I haven't done yet. That's right. That's right. Don't want to be premature. That's right. All right. So with all those miles under your trail runners, have you come up with a, a trail name? Has a trail name been bestowed upon you? Yep. So my trail name is Quadzilla uh, because I have large quads and I think I got it somewhere in the Smokies. Um, just somebody like pointed at me and said like Quadzilla and that, that, that stuck from there. And it's, that's kind of my hallmark is my meme. Now I wear really short shorts and um, I get a lot of attention from like middle-aged women with all the shorts. I've noticed that <laughs> which is kind of hilarious, but yeah, it's really fun. Very comfortable. Speaking of middle-aged women, don't tell her I said this, but, but Mrs. Doc said, is he Quadzilla? Cause he has really big quads. I said, yeah, I think, I think that's the, the premise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very good. I mean, there are, that's a great name. That is a fantastic name. Uh, It is kind of long, you know, Quadzilla, that's three syllables. It is. Most people will like shorten it to Quadzi. I get Quadzi a lot. Quadzi. I like that. Okay. (laughs) All right. Well, from here on out on the, uh, on the podcast, you are Quadzilla or Quadzi. All right. Hey, have you had a chance to listen to any of our episodes here on the podcast? Yeah, I've been listening to the the calendar year triple with the Buzz and Woody. Um, mm-hmm. Those that's crazy that those guys did that just their first through hikes and went for it. Wild, uh, pretty amazing. And I was listening to your two taps episode. I, I met him randomly out in Arches, um, and we got to talking through hiking. Okay. So I guess you know we uh, dirty hiker trash recognizes each other. <laughs> <laughs> so you are familiar with the format and you know that we have a segment coming up towards the end of the episode that's called the pro tip inside of the week. I'll turn to you and I'll say quadzi. Uh, what, what bit of trail wisdom do you have to share with our listeners to make their next outdoor experience even better? So don't be surprised when we get there. Perfect. I'll be thinking about that. Okay. And feel free to drop, uh, you know, trail wisdom throughout the podcast, but you will be, you, you won't be off the hook. Uh, no matter how many, how many tidbits you drop along the way, you will still have to provide one at the very end. Sure. Perfect. Okay. Hey, another feature we've been doing this season is the must bring gear review sponsored by the ultralight backpacking gear company, outdoor vitals. And here's how it works. If you were to let a stranger pack your bag with pretty much generic gear for a multi-day hike, what is the one specific piece of gear you would insist on being packed? And if you've got a particular brand for that specific piece of gear, even better. So Quadzi, what's your must bring piece of gear? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, there's, I mean, everything you carry with you hopefully is pretty vital, but the one thing that comes to mind with me is I love my, um, sea to summit pillow. And I think it's totally worth it. I don't know. It's three or four ounces. It's not that heavy, but it's, um, it's totally worth it. And it makes sleeping so much more comfortable. So I will carry that pillow with me everywhere I go. Totally agree. You know, I, I tried the, the recommended method of just taking a stuff sack and putting some clothes in there and, and using that as a pillow, you know, multi multi-purpose, items like that but it's just not the same it's just not the same and it's you know it's it's so convenient and comfortable so why not 
And that's mm. how your pack ends up as 50 pounds is all these little things that weigh nothing. <laughs> that, right. And speaking uh, of your pack and, and 50 pounds, I mean, what, what was your base weight on the long trails? So when I started off the Appalachian trail, it was very heavy. I had my only previous backpacking experience to that was in the army infantry. And so like an infantry load, you're looking at a 50 plus pound pack, plus your weapon, plus ammo, plus, you know, it might be 80 to hundred pounds, depending on what you're doing. So I had in my head, like, Oh, I can, I can carry this weight. It's not a big deal. So I had a 65 liter Osprey that pack weighed like five and a half pounds by itself. And just, I I think at one point I had both a tent and a hammock because I went out there thinking I wanted a hammock, but then also I want to sleep in shelters and tent. And so, yeah, at one point I had both a tent and a hammock. So that base weight, um, it was somewhere North of 30 pounds, uh, in the beginning. And I never left a town under 50 pounds. Um, and I went up Mount Washington with like a three pound ham, and thinking because it was on sale at Walmart and went there hungry. And so I was thinking, like, you know, I've got four or five days out there. I can eat all of this. So and I came off the mountain with two and a half pounds of ham <laughs> that I did not eat. So yeah, that it was very, very heavy pack. And I had to stop like every hour because that's what the infantry training was too. Every time you like, you stop every hour, take a rest. And like, I had to do that because my shoulders just killing me and i did that whole hike that way like walk an hour take a rest walk an hour and it looks like looking back like i had no idea what i was doing uh it's pretty ridiculous that's interesting because i don't know if you've listened to any episodes where we've we've interviewed ginger balls but uh ginger balls is a triple crowner as well and he um he showed up to the at having retired from the military after 20 i think 22 years of of service he was a lieutenant commander when he finished in the navy and uh, he was had double fail safes on everything. You know, if mm-hmm. he was ready that if, if something went wrong, he had a replacement for that. And if the replacement went wrong, he had a replacement for that as well. And so he showed up to the to, to Springer Mountain wearing like, a, I don't know, 50, 60 pound pack, just prepared for anything and everything. And uh, he met up with Scrapbook there, who was 21 years old at the time, maybe 20 years old at the time. And the AT was his third long trail. That was going to be his triple crown trail. And scrapbook was wearing like a 13 pound pack. And they both, this is the funniest moment in my mind. They, they met each other there at Springer mountain and they looked at each other and each one of them thought in their minds, Oh, this guy's never going to make it. This yes. guy doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> Did they both make it? They both made it. They both made it. Uh, Scrappy, Scrappy became a triple crowner on that, that hike and ginger balls um, was hooked on the, the long trail and went on to do the PCT and the CDT. Wow. Cool. And he just, uh, excuse me. And he just finished the Hey Duke this year as well. That's, that's high on my list. I met two people this year that they've both done the Hey Duke without caches. And so I had always in my mind thought you have to cash things, but I guess if you can do thirties and push big miles um, and the water's good that year, and then you really don't need to do caches. Although they were saying like, you have to do 12 liter water carries uh, if you're doing that, which seems terrible, but I, I don't know. I think I'd rather not cash. <laughs> well, you know, 12 liters that uh, what you've learned about, about backpacking and what you should include in your pack. I mean, that would probably equal the same amount of weight as what you showed up with on the AT. I think so. Yeah. You would still, yeah. you know, it wouldn't just, be that terrible. A 50, 60 pound pack. You yeah. You just take a break it. every hour. You'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no. The, so speaking of heavy packs, the, my, the heaviest pack I've ever had was when I bike packed the Arizona trail and you have to disassemble your bike and carry it through the grand Canyon. Cause I think they don't want people riding their bike and killing themselves. Um, so my bike itself was a full steel Sterling ECR. So that thing weighed 45 pounds by itself. And then I had it like you have, I have to figure out how to strap it to my pack. So I use my old last break because that's the only pack that could handle that weight. And then all my other stuff, you know, you still have your sleep system or your camping gear, food, water. So it ended up, I was going down into the grand Canyon with 85 pounds on my back. Um, and it, it was just incredibly miserable. Um, I remember I have like, I took a bunch of video through it and like after hours and hours, I came to this sign and it said South Rim, two and a half miles. <laughs> yeah. And so I had, I had planned on two days through that thing, but it ended up taking three full days. And that 
to date is probably some of the most painful backpacking I've ever done. Um, just with so much weight and it, it was, you know, just hanging off of me, probably separated by a good 10 inches, that bike just, yeah, not fun. Now, Quadzi, how tempted were you? Were you looking over your shoulder, looking for where a ranger might be or might not be? Just, you know, assemble, assemble that bike real quick and, and just knock that part of the trail out right there. I know, right? Like that would be, I think if it were easier to assemble, I probably would have done it, but it's such a pain to put it together too. <laughs> oh man. And it's hanging off your back. You said 10 inches off your back. I mean, that's one of the things I see with, with new hikers out there who are, They've got all the, the latest gear from REI and it's hanging way off of their back. It's not tight against their, their shoulders. And that's one of the things I, you know, I try not to be a, a you know, nosy or, or, you know, butt my nose into people's business, but I, it just pains me to see people hiking like that. And I'd say, Hey, if you tighten that, if you pull that pack close to your shoulders, you're going to be a lot better off. But with that bike at that, at that weight being 10 inches off your shoulders, that just sounds so painful. Yeah. And I don't know what the physics, because like the weight is the same, but it feels so much heavier. Um, it, yeah, it was just a crushing, crushing amount of weight. I don't recommend anyone that thinks about bike backing the Arizona trail so much better to hike it. Don't. Yeah. If any of our listeners out there are physicists, uh, please, please, uh, write in and let us know what is the difference in weight and the feeling of weight uh, between a, a 45 pound bike tight against your back, tight against your shoulders or 10 inches off your shoulders. I'd be interested to hear what that, you know, what yeah. the difference there, it, it yeah. feels like a lot. I'm sure it felt, it felt like 200 pounds. It was <laughs> good. <laughs> hey, Quadzilla, we've got a, uh, a section called hiking pole where we, we kind of take a little, little cruise through some gear here. I asked you some questions to decide if you are sane or crazy. And so, okay. I've got, I've got four questions here to kind of, as a jumping off point into discussions about gear, we'll start with the first one. It's an easy one. I think boots or trail runners, trail runners. Okay. Very good. And do you have a specific brand of trail runners that you favor? I've worn a lot of Vasque, their constant velocity, and then the ultras. And I've been lucky every brand of trail runner I try works well for me. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just whatever is cheap and on sale generally. Mm -hmm. Now, did you start out hiking with trail runners or did you make the, the jump from boots to trail runners at some point? I did. That was one of the research points you just come across. Like everyone says we're trail runners on the AT. So I went with that. Okay. And never had any problems with your feet. Not really. Um, trying to think this year, I probably had the most problems coming out the gate. I just hadn't, I've been so busy with what I was uh, doing that I just hadn't run or hiked or anything. And I just kind of hopped on trail and started doing high twenties right out the gate. And I had blisters probably for most of Washington and the really big blisters and like a ton of foot pain. Um, and that was just from starting off too fast, but then after that, everything resolved and I didn't have any, any issues. And so it, that's kind of my philosophy is if it's not an injury, I just hike through it and it always resolves itself so far knock on wood. So I don't know if that's a good philosophy, but that's worked for me. That's almost, it almost sounds like a pro tip, but uh, we'll keep going. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, tent or tarp tent tent. Okay. And why, why is it that you prefer a tent over a tarp? Um, I'm big on comfort out there. Like, so this, I carried a big Agnes fly Creek two person this year and um, like just having all of that room, because other than walking, you're spending the most amount of time in your tent, especially when it's raining or anything else. So it's just, I like to have the room. Um, and I've seen these other actually, so I don't have experience with like tarp tent setups or those tarp setups. So it's just mm -hmm. my perception. And my perception is that they take forever to set or they're harder to set up and you know, you get more wet in them. And I just, once I'm set up, I just want to be dry and, and comfortable and yes. I'll carry a little bit of extra weight for that. Yeah, I went I went down the rabbit hole and trying to be uh, be lighter on the trail, and so I went with uh, went with a tarp. And I spent you know hours on the weekend just falling down the the tarp YouTube rabbit hole and watching different sets setups and and different pitches. And uh, they're pretty easy to set up once you once you get the hang of it. But uh, you're right. I mean, in terms of of comfort uh, tent keeps you, keeps you away from the bugs and uh, gives you a little bit of privacy. So. Yeah. The okay. bugs are a big one too. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I cannot stand 
I don't understand how people sleep out when mosquitoes and whatnot are out. Like they eat me alive. So mm-hmm. that was all of Washington for me this year. Just as soon as you're done with the day, just dive into your tent and, and escape the mosquitoes. Yeah. The, the conditions have to be just right for some good cowboy camping. Otherwise you just get eaten up. Right. Okay. Sleeping bag or quilt? Hmm. I guess it, that depends on if it's cold, definitely sleeping bag, but I'll, I'll transition to quilts when it's warmer, just to save a little bit of, bit of weight. Okay. Okay. And here's, here's the, the defining question, stove or cold soak? Stove. Definitely. Okay. You fall on the, you fall on the same spectrum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, 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 uh, I tried cold soaking on the AT. So just to save some weight towards the end and I'd finished at the, it was like the end of November. And I remember one of my worst days was Thanksgiving. And I had this just cold bag of ramen in this shelter by myself. And I just wanted to sit there and cry. Like, this is my Thanksgiving with this cold bag. So that's left a really, um, really bad taste in my mouth uh, with cold soaking. And I think in the future, if I go stoveless, I'll just plan more kind of sandwiches and stuff is there's, I don't see any benefit to eating cold ramen versus eating just more chips or, or uh, tortillas or something like that. Now your Thanksgiving story, I'm not sure where that was going to go. I thought maybe you were going to tell me that you took the two and a half pounds of ham and you put it into your cold soak jar and it just uh, didn't have the same impact. Yeah. That would have been better if I had <laughs> two and a half pounds of ham half that day. <laughs> I didn't plan that well. All right. Hey, do you drill holes in your toothbrush? No, no, I'm probably, I could be considered an ultra heavy hiker. I think <laughs> ultra <this> heavy. <laughs> yeah. Like as, as much as I try, my pack is always just so heavy this year. It was still around 20 pounds and I'll always carry around a bunch of camera gear. So that adds a lot of weight to it. And I, yeah, I don't know. It's like I can carry the weight. So then I just end up carrying stuff and, um, I've never gotten into that ultra light philosophy. I think I'm going to try to be better this next season, but we'll see. I think you should just embrace it. I mean, we start a whole new movement. Forget this ultra light stuff where you're you're not comfortable and you're, you know, you're you're in pain. I mean, you, you can go the other direction. Just lean into it. I'm I'm an ultra heavy hiker. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> start that trend. I might might even want to trademark that or brand that. That'd be that'd be good. Okay. <laughs> Hey, before we get too far down the trail, I want to hear about your background, where you grew up, uh, what kinds of sports and hobbies you were involved in. I want to hear about the army experience. I want to find out how you got involved in the through hiking cult, because sure. it is a cult any organization that can convinces you to uh, be out in the, in the wilderness and the dirt and, and sleeping in the dirt for months on end has to be a cult. So, yeah. So, uh, my story is a little different. I was born in China and I came over here when I was eight. Um, and so I don't know if you would get in the whole thing, but yeah, I was uh, adopted when I was eight over here because my father was, um, he, he was, uh, gave a speech in front of about a hundred thousand students in China during 89 during Tiananmen square. And they threw him in prison for that, for speaking out against the government. So my family wanted me to get out of China. And so that was how I was, I eventually came over here at the age of eight, um, left every single person in the world that I knew. And then from there, I grew up in Missouri. I went to um, University of Missouri in Columbia and actually have an accounting degree. <laughs> and that was um, really towards the end of that was kind of how I got onto a different path was realizing like, I do not want to be an accountant, having worked a couple of, uh, of internships and seeing just how miserable that work is. Um, and so I got into, um, I started one summer, I just started doing uh, YouTube with this um, video game at the time, Diablo three. And one of my videos got really popular. And so then I started trying to figure out like what, what differentiates me. So I had gotten into fitness a lot and video games. So I made this YouTube channel called the healthy gamer. And I did that for a couple, a couple of years. And um, so that was kind of tangentially how I moved to the path of um, fitness and whatnot, because it was fitness that brought me out of my video game addiction. So I had been like very heavily addicted to video games for many years to the point where I almost failed out of college. Um, it was a really big problem in my life and it was um, getting into bodybuilding and fitness and being able to see that if I can put hard work into something, then I can achieve some pretty incredible results. And that was kind of a, 
um, that gave me that sense of control with probably for the first time in a long time. And because I, yeah, so like, I just kind of went through um, a lot of periods of depression when I was uh, essentially from the time I was 16, 17 until into my uh, late twenties. And, and that it was just kind of this, this whole cycle every winter, a couple of months. And, and I was just always looking for something to make life. Okay. And so then that's how I got into through hiking is I was in one of these. Let's, let's put a pause yeah. on it right there. Sure. Cause we've just covered a lot of ground. There's a <laughs> yeah. lot to unpack right there. <laughs> You know, sometimes I ask questions and I'm not sure what the answers are going to be. And sometimes the, the answers are, are pretty typical and not surprising. And sometimes I'm just blown away by the answers and people's stories. And you fall into the latter category so far. I mean, what a story. Uh, leaving your country behind at eight years old because your father was thrown in prison for his, his speaking out against Tiananmen Square. Right. And coming to a country where you basically knew nobody, right? You were right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, nobody. Wow. I mean, some of us have our toughest challenges ahead. And I think, you know, in some cases like you, I mean, you've experienced, you know, some of the toughest episodes that anybody can come across. That, that's just incredible. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's looking back because there I've had some really dark times in life. And I've recognized like a lot of my challenges have come directly as a result of leaving China and then. Uh, my father, he, so he passed when I was about 13. Um, and then that was retrospectively, that was when I really dove into these online video games and started just playing them nonstop. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, there's definitely a cause there. Um, and you know, it's like, man, sometimes I think, man, life would have been so much easier if I could have just been happy working as an accountant and lived a normal life and have a family and do the normal stuff, but depression and all this stuff always got in the way. But um, like, I'm really happy with who I am now and I wouldn't have had nearly that like strength or resilience or develop those things without these challenges. So it is, um, I don't know where I'm going with this, but it's, uh, yeah, yeah that's like, it's yeah, like yeah. a blessing and a curse, you know, that's right. Everything that has happened up to this point has led you to this point. Exactly. I mean, you would, you wouldn't be where you are right now if all that other stuff hadn't happened. So I mean, as, as difficult and as challenging and as troubling as it, as it was at the time, I mean, at least you're here right now. Absolutely. And I think that's a big part of like why I can through hike is I built up that resilience when I was young and that has now translated into being able to do some pretty cool things. Mm -hmm. Now, short side trip here. What uh, you, you talked about video game addiction. What were your, what were your, your video games of choice? Oh man. So I started off Ultima online. I don't know if you're a gamer. Right. Oh yeah. I, I was, I, you know, back, back when in the, in the early days of video games, I was, I was playing them. Yeah. Yeah. So it was Ultima online into mm -hmm. EverQuest into world of Warcraft. Okay. Um, and then in like every other big game in between, but those are my big, that's what sucked me away was those uh, MMOs. Yeah. I spent many an hour with uh, Diablo one and Diablo two. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, you know they just released a remake of Diablo two. I, 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 I think I saw that. I think I saw that. I can't get into it anymore. <laughs> oh no, it's it no. doesn't have the same attraction anymore. No, it doesn't. But oh, that brought up a uh, memory. So I played Ultima Online uh, with a bunch of my mom's friends from work, and one of the guys, his uh, in-game name was Toes. So it's kind of funny, like a trail name. But he actually was a software engineer. He didn't have. He was born without arms, so he could type with his feet. And he was software engineer. He, he, he played that game with his feet. And, you know, I'd be online all the time and just be talking to him. And it really struck me one day. He said, uh, he asked like, Jack, do you know why I like playing this game so much? And he says, because in this game, I can be someone that I'm not in real life. And like that really struck me. It's like, wow, you know, that's probably why I play too. Because in this game, I'm powerful and I have a community and I'm liked, but that's not the case in real life. And I... Yeah, it was just really struck me. Like, that's probably why a lot of people are addicted because in that game, they can be someone that they're not in real life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, a guy with a guy playing playing the game with his feet. Did he, did he, uh, was he beating you up on that? Yeah, no, he, it oh. was crazy how he could, <laughs> he could probably have a good Twitch following today. <laughs> See, that would make me feel bad about myself. Here I am with, uh, you know, two arms and two legs, 10 fingers. And this guy is just wailing on me with, with his feet. That's just, right, exactly. uh, it's not good. And, and able to work as a software engineer. Right. <laughs> his day. 
<laughs> wow. Now, did you grow up in Missouri? Yes. Okay. All right. Let's pick back up with your with your narrative here on uh, bouts of depression and discovering uh, through hiking or, or backpacking or, or how did that come about? Yeah. So let's see. So it was, I, I was just always looking for something to make life. Okay. And so I think that was part of why I joined the army. That was why. So I opened a CrossFit gym in 2015 and I had been doing some other startup um, type stuff. So I was always looking for something where like, I'll achieve this and then life will be okay. And I think around the time that I decided to hike the AT was the crushing realization. Like I had accomplished enough of these things to realize that there is nothing that I'm going to do that will make life. Okay. And it was just kind of like a crushing despair to think, um, you know, you're, cause when you're young, you can have all these things to look forward to and think like, well, maybe life sucks now, but then it'll get better. But as the years go on and you accomplish these things and like, well, I'm still really depressed. I still have just all of this, darkness within that just is compounding and growing. And I think the AT for me was really kind of a Hail Mary where I, um, you know, it's just, yeah, just looking back because now I'm in such a good place, but I was in so many dark places back then. And I think it was one of these, I've, I got to try something really big and really different, or this is going to, you know, end in suicide is going to, I'm not going to live for another 10 years. That was kind of, that was, it was really the trajectory that I was on. And that's what it felt like is like, things were just getting worse and they weren't getting better. And I felt kind of out of control and I didn't know how to change. I didn't know what to do. Um, and then, yeah, coming across like Bill Bryson's book, a walk in the woods and something about it just really spoke to my, my heart, uh, my soul, and just like made me really excited. And so I just kind of, sold everything, gave it all up. And uh, 45 days later, I was at Springer, I think May 8th, started hiking northbound. Okay. Now you kind of glossed over your army experience. How long, how old were you when you enlisted? How long were you in the army and uh, where were you stationed? Yeah. So I was 21, I think, yeah, 21 when I enlisted. So I joined the National Guard. So I just took a semester off. I was in college at the time as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Went to basic in Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, Sand Hill. And uh, that was, I, I really enjoy my uh, time in the military. My biggest complaint about the army was there's so much bureaucratic BS. Like when we were doing infantry things, I really enjoyed that. And that was a lot of fun. Um, but it, there's just too much kind of sit around and wait and do nothing in between that kind of killed my drive. Uh, but it was, it was a really great experience. I, there were some incredible leaders that I was under that I, it really taught me a lot about how to grow up and like kind of be. Uh, I don't know, be a man, being an adult, which I didn't get because, you know, I did, I grew up without a father. Um, and actually that leads me to another point I'll go into a little bit later about, uh, my father on the AT, but, um, yeah. And I, I had joined the army back then because, um, I wanted to have the skills to resist a tyrannical government. Like I think my earlier influences from China really still spoke to me. Like I, I really appreciated, um, just the freedom that we have here. And I want, you know, like, I, I really felt that like, this is the, the precious thing, um, having lived in China and seen that, um, you know, the tyran- tyranny firsthand. And like, this is a precious thing and it's, we can't take it for granted and it is, it can easily be taken away. And I think that's something that, um, you know, people, some, some hikers I've met, like, you know, if you grow up, um, you grow up with having things and you go to a college and it's like, you're kind of insulated from some of the evils of the world. And, and I think sometimes if people haven't seen how bad it can be and how, you know, just evil some people in the world can be, you, you don't get a sense of that. I'm just really rambling here, but you, yeah, you don't get a sense of how bad things can get. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that really stuck with me with my China experience was that what we have here is pretty rare and precious and it can be gone um, very quickly. And it, it, it requires people to uh, be able to uh, defend it. And I, yeah, and that whole, you know, like 
I don't know, we get all, all about how the military is used for the military industrial complex and all of that. But I think ultimately I wanted to have the skills. I didn't want to be afraid like I was in China and how everyone was in China. And that was kind of what really prompted me to join the army. Mm -hmm. And any, any uh, skills or traits developed in the army that you found very useful on the trail? Yeah, I think just the one, like you just learn to go from meal to meal. Um, that's super helpful for the trail. You learn in the army that like nothing is as bad as people make it out to be people. I went to a couple of different schools, air assault, um, combatives, uh, too. And you hear all these horror stories about how it's going to be so tough and whatever. And it, you, I just came away from every one of those experiences, you know, well, this wasn't nearly as bad as people were making it out to be. And I think that's the same with the trail. You can read all this stuff online on gut hooks. And when you get there, it's almost universally like, oh, this wasn't that bad. And the bad things are the things that you never think about that, that never crossed your mind. Those That's are the right. Really, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of fear mongering out there. I know that uh, folks on the PCT heading northbound spend the first 700 miles talking about how bad the Sierras are going to be. Mm. And I have found, I, you know, I haven't done a, a long trail, but I have found in my, in my working life and in my personal life that usually the, the worrying about something is far worse than the actual something in most Agreed. cases. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of mental energy, just wasted, uh, worrying about, you know, what's going to happen, what could happen. This is not going to be a, a fun phone call or a fun, uh, you know, confrontation. And, uh, generally it's, it's not nearly as bad as you thought it was going to be. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's kind of the same with, with army and through hiking, because you're both of those things, you're forced to do a lot of things that you just would otherwise not do or not want to do. And, repeating those experiences over and over again, you realize, well, none of it is really that bad. Like, I don't want to wake up at four in the morning, but once you do, it's not that bad. I don't want to lay in the wet grass, you know, for six hours pulling guard, but it's not that bad. And the same with through hiking, like you don't want to go through storms. You don't want to be cold. You don't want to be hungry, but you go through it and it's not that bad. And so I think that, yeah, was another thing I gained from that experience. Just like, well, I don't know, like, Cause I was, yeah, I was very anxious and shy and, um, had a lot of worries and fears like joining the army was the scariest thing. And that was during the Oh nine where we had just had the surge in Iraq and I fully expected we were an infantry unit. Like we'd be shipped over to Iraq and Afghanistan within my contract time. Thankfully we weren't, but like, those are the things that were on my mind. Like we're going to go through this, um, you know, extreme training and then we're going to go overseas uh, and be in combat and to face those fears and to come out the other side i think really helped me um, grow as a person that's awesome tell us a little bit about your adoptive family you came over at age eight um you said you didn't have a father figure yeah so uh nancy who that was who adopted me um she mm -hmm. was just single at the time and um yeah, since then. And so just grew up with her in Bolivar, a little tiny little town in Missouri. Okay. Um, it was just the two of you? Yep. Yep. So okay. I've got, yeah, you know, you know uh, aunt and uncle and grandma and grandpa. And that was, yeah, very small family. And I know you said you went to school for accounting and you did some internships for, for accounting. Uh, was there a moment uh, when you were in those internships where a, a voice whispered to you and said, Hey, this is not the path for you. Yeah. I think it was every moment that I <laughs> was in the office there. <laughs> I talked to a guy one time who was a, he was a, a rising um, executive in advertising and he was sitting in his, his office in downtown LA and out of nowhere, I mean, he had never had any experience with hiking, backpacking, camping, nothing. And out of nowhere, this voice in his head sounds off about the Pacific Crest Trail. And from that moment, it changed. His whole life changed. He, he is no longer in advertising and he's out there on the trails and living, living the life that he wants to live. Wow. Yeah. No, we're just not as humans. We're not meant to do the same thing every day and go to the same place every day and be inside. And like, we've built a society that is totally at odds with how humans are supposed to live. And I think, and I think it's, so it's really natural that everyone is depressed and is feeling bad. And like, it's, it's just crazy to me when I think about how we've built this entire society where most of the people in it 
kind of hate their lives, yet they have to do what they have to do day in and day out just to survive, just to live another day that they don't enjoy. So that that just never made sense to me. And that was a big push on to get in the trail because it's like, well, why, if I'm just going to do the same thing that I hate for the next 40 years, what's the point of living for another 40 years? Why not just do what I want to do now? And if I end up not being able to live, not being able to support myself, then just die rather, you know, better to live five good years than 40 shitty years or however, you know, uh, that's kind of how I look at it now. Yes. Now I lost my train of thought here, so I'm going to edit this part out, but, uh, hang on. We were just talking sure. about, uh, uh, Oh, okay. I got it. Here we go. Okay. So you're not in accounting, obviously. What, what are you doing to pay the bills to finance your trips? Yes. Yeah, so the last couple of years, I worked um, Conservation Corps in 2019. I was up in Helena, Montana, which uh, trail town, CDT trail town, loved, wonderful town, um, had a great time up there. And then I worked down in Durango, um, another trail town, uh, Colorado. And yeah, that was really cool work. We uh, just got to be out in the woods eight days at a time, just cutting down trees and doing thinning projects and stuff like that. And then on my days off, I'd have my little van built out and I just take it around to visit, uh, you know, different national parks and all sorts of different, it was like, I got to see so much stuff that year, just with that schedule, just one amazing place after another. And then last year I worked uh, wildland fire. I was on a hotshot crew up in Idaho. Um, and that was pretty intense, crazy work. I think in five and a half months, we worked, like 2,200 hours, 2,100 hours, something crazy like that. Um, 1,100 hours of overtime. And we were all, we were fighting fires all across the U S and that schedule was 14 days on two days off. And then you're right back out there again. Now as a hotshot, did you get dropped into fire zones and have to, to do some, some clearing of brush and other stuff to prevent uh, the fire from spreading? Yeah. So th I think you're thinking, you might be thinking of smoke jumpers. Those are the ones oh, that jump okay. out of an airplane, yeah, yeah. which so I, I talked to a couple of them and they're trained to, because I'm like, where do you, where do you, there's not a, like a landing zone out in the middle of the forest. And they're trained to like, if there's not a good place to land, they just snag their shoots in the trees and that's how they land. And if, you know, like army parachuting, um, landing in a tree is how you break your back. So it's crazy to me that like that's how the smoke jumpers are taught. Like, well, if there's not a good place to land, we just snag in the trees and and drop in. But a hotshot crew is a little different. So, kind of military terms, like a uh, smoke jumper would probably be considered like special forces, whereas a hotshot crew might be 75th Ranger Regiment, where you know the Rangers are the are the uh, specialized light infantry door kickers. There's a lot of them. They can get a lot of work done. Whereas the SF guys are more covert operations, doing more highly specialized things. So the shot crew, we would just go in, um, we're usually 20 man crews and, um, they'll usually call up a shot crew when a fire is starting to rage or get out of control. And your job is just go in and put in line. And so line is where you'll go in and cut, um, you know, anywhere from 10 to 40 feet of the forest. They'll cut all the brush away. The saw teams will cut all the brush away, cut down some trees, limb up the trees. And then the dig will come behind and the dig that I was part of the dig you just literally dig like a trench in um, the, the ground. And so like 12 to 16 inches um, and, you know, the, the saying in fire is down to bare mineral soil. So then when that fire comes through it, the intensity lessens and then it burns slowly up to that, um, that line that you dug. And then hopefully that, well, that's the whole, yeah, the line should hold barring, you know, weather or wind or whatnot. And that's, it's crazy. That's how we stop most forest fires still in the 21st century is you send crews out into the forest to build miles and miles and miles of line. Um, and so I, I've described it to hikers as like that work is it's um, like all the things that you just don't want to do is what you do all day. Like if you're hiking, you're like, I don't want to go up that really steep hill. Like that's what you have to do. Like, I don't want to bushwhack through all this, you know, shrub, like that's what you have to do. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to pick up rocks and pick up logs. And so it's just, the days are really hard and it's just filled with like things like, man, I just don't, it's, I don't want to do this, <laughs> but that's your whole day. And 16 hour shifts, um, sometimes longer, 14 days at a time. 
Wow. So you're not special forces jumping out of the plane. You are, you are a ranger, army ranger, kicking in doors and getting stuff done. Yeah, that's I think that's yeah. a good comparison. You're yeah. just you're the brute force. You're just out there to mm-hmm. put in put in line, miles and miles of line. All right. Now, before we take our break, one final question: Is there a, a significant other? Is there a, a for for Quadzilla out there? There is not right now. Not right no, now. Okay. No. And so that's yeah. It's I've had um, you know significant others uh, my other hikes, and now I'm at this point where I just wanted to um, travel and see the world, and it's kind of, it's hard to do these things with someone else to find someone that could take all this time off and whatnot. So uh, maybe I'll meet somebody on the trail, but no, I'm happy by myself now and, and get out there. Okay. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to hear some, uh, some nitty gritty details from the trail from his uh, almost finished uh, triple crown. And then what he's got planned coming up. Uh, Stay tuned for that. We'll be right back. The John Freakin' Muir Pod is sponsored by Outdoor Vitals, the ultralight backpacking gear company whose mission is to improve the mental, physical, and emotional health of mankind by facilitating impactful outdoor experiences. Outdoor Vitals creates innovative technical products with confidence inspiring education that empower outdoor ultralight adventurers. Their focus on performance enables you to live ultralight with gear you can actually be confident with. Whether you're looking for an ultralight sleep system, shelter, or pack, or if you're looking for top quality apparel for the trail, you can find it at Outdoor Vitals. Do yourself a favor. Live ultra light. And welcome back. We are in the middle of our episode here with Quadzilla. Heard about his background, his very unusual and unique background, and, and some of the things he's had to overcome. And now we want to talk about his hiking resume. Let's let's talk about uh, your time out on the trail. I know you started off in 2016 on the AT. You showed up with a heavy pack and uh, you hiked an hour at a time for 2,200 miles. How long did that take you? I was on trail for a long time. I think it was ended up being, it was over six months because I started in May and I finished at the end of November. And I, I think it was 205 days actually is Okay. It came out to be. Yeah. That's, yeah a I fair, took, that's a fair amount of time. It was a good, yeah. And I had, a, so I flipped in the middle. So I went up to Maine and I was in Maine in August and it was just the perfect time to be up in Maine and just have, you know, there's like a lake every eight or 10 miles in Maine. Um, and I stopped at every single one of them. I'd, if it didn't matter if it was a four miles that day, I'd do those four miles. I set up my camp. I'd go float out on there with my little sleeping mat and just hang out. And that was, um, super worth it. But then, yeah, then I, I had to finish in the winter, uh, which the last six, 700 miles of AT were just pretty miserable for me. It was cold and like, it was getting dark at five o'clock every day. The leaves are off the trees. Like nobody else was on the trail. Uh, and, um, yeah, but the nice thing is you had the shelters all to yourself. So you just have the shelters and just stand at the edge and go pee <laughs> without having to put my shoes on. Um, <laughs> Nice. The silver lining right there. Exactly. Yeah. But those, that was some, uh, I was in a lot of pain then. So my, uh, apparently I had stress fractures in both of my feet for about the last six, 700 miles. And I had, I think Lyme disease, like my joints just locked up every morning. Um, like super, super inflamed. I was taking 400 milligrams of the ibuprofen every two hours for the entire day. So like way more than the amount that you're supposed to take. And that was um, the only way I could get through it. And it's, it's funny looking back, like, I just thought that's what backpacking was like, you're just in just that incredible amount of pain. But um, my other trails have not been like that at all. And I don't think I would keep backpacking if it was that painful all the time. Um, so it's, um, I think that was just a combination of having way too much weight on my back. And then, you know, that, that lime, and then, um, just being new to long distance backpacking. And thankfully my other trails, I've, my body's held up much better. I don't, I'm not in, not even like a 10th amount of the pain that I was in at that time. Now I, I usually ask this question a little bit later in the, in the interview, but uh, I have to ask it now because what, what would, what would 2021 Quadzilla whisper in the ear of 2016 Quadzilla heading off to, to Springer? Yeah. Just like, <laughs> go lighter, man. 
Like it's not a competition. <laughs> you don't win for having the heaviest pack. <laughs> yeah, I I had a lot of like pride around my pack. I'd be like, "Oh, your pack's only thirty pounds. Mine's 50. <laughs> like how stupid. That's that's like <laughs> reverse. That's reverse bragging right there. I mean, you, people are bragging out there about how 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 light their pack is, not not how heavy it is. Yeah, it is exactly the opposite side of like ultra ultra light circle jerks. <laughs> like that, the opposite side of that same coin. I am Quadzilla, and I am an ultra heavy backpacker yeah <laughs> my pack will crush you <laughs> all right hey what were what were some of your favorite moments out there on the at do you, do you i know it sounded painful at times but there had to be moments of just pure joy out there oh there were and there you just i just met so many really cool people out there um i met one guy i remember distinctly bear edwin is his name he's a seven seven one and he started off weighing at 380 pounds and he said the approach trail took him like two or three days and he had to, uh, he was just going tree to tree. He would walk to the next tree, take a break, walk to the next tree. And I met him somewhere. I, I met him after I, no, before I flipped and then after I flipped as well. And he was just really impressed me with his um, kind of perseverance. And, and he ended up finishing the trail, I think after eight ish months and he had lost well over a hundred pounds. I think maybe closer to 140. Uh, wow. Yeah. He was a, he was a cool dude and just so many, yeah, so many cool people, um, like that. And I, that was my first exposure to kind of, you know, weird, weird people, people living lifestyles that were outside of the box because before then I was just an accountant and living my regular life. And so it was really cool to meet all these different people and to open my horizons and be like, wow, I don't have to live a traditional life if I don't want to. Um, and just, yeah, just so many interesting people. Um, Oh, one other memory that popped up. So I was hiking in the Grayson Highlands in, was that Virginia? And uh, it was like a really beautiful day. They have all these wild ponies there. And it was like a mystical day. There was fog rolling in. And um, as I hiked through that day, uh, towards the end of the day, I just had this memory pop up like spontaneously. And it was when I was leaving China and my dad had sat me on his knee and he asked me to... I think he asked me like to forgive him for all the times he was mad. Like um, he's not, he wasn't abusive or anything, but you know, dads yell at their kids. Um, he asked me to forgive him for that and told me that he loved me. And that was a memory that I just didn't have. It was like a suppressed memory or it, it just like I, that memory just spontaneously came up and I remembered it. And then it was this cascading of realizations of thinking like, wow, you know, that was a big part of why I joined the army was because I was looking for father figures for approval. And that was a big part of why I've done a lot of these things. It was like this need to get approval from male adult figures because I didn't have that. And then there was like this piece and saying like, well, you know, you're, you don't need, you don't need that anymore. Like, it's okay. Like you don't need to go through your whole life searching for approval from people. Um, and that was, yeah, that was just spontaneous and like, amazing in the Grayson Highlands there on the AT. And, and I think that realization, it like, it really helped me to make better decisions going forward, not having that need for approval from all of, you know. Well, that is, that is a magical moment. I mean, just the location and, and what happened to you there, that, that spontaneous memory, what, what do you think caused that? You know, I don't know. I, uh, I wonder if it's something about hiking it you know, it, it does kind of put you in, into an altered state of consciousness. You're hiking out there. You're, um, I think it, the science says like long endurance, um, work will kind of turn off your prefrontal cortex. So that part of your mind, that's always judging and, um, worrying and discerning. And so, um, yeah, it's something about just that walking that gave me enough space to then allow this repressed memory to pop up and like, it cleared so much up for me. Right. That is, that's fantastic. Now it took you close to six months, eight months, six months. Yeah. Six months, six months, eight days, months, yeah. eight months, eight months was bare. Right. Took you took you six months and it sounded like you were in a considerable amount of pain for some of that. Um, why continue the long trails? If, if it, if it uh, was that painful and it took that long, I know a lot of people would say, you know what, maybe this, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe, maybe I should, you know, submit that job application back to that accounting firm. Yeah. And I think our bodies do a great job of forgetting pain as soon as it's over. 
Um, yep. That's probably a blessing, like, or else we would never do any of this stuff ever again. Um, and I, I did, I tried to. So when I um, got home from the AT, I went back to Missouri. I had a long-term relationship at the time. And so I went back, I got a, an, another accounting job at this place that I used to work at before. Um, and I tried to work in it. Just, it felt, everything just felt kind of dead and lifeless. And it was like every day, the screaming thing in my head saying, this isn't where you're supposed to be. And what excited me was the thought of doing another, another hike, doing another uh, trail, doing some, yeah, some adventure. Yeah. There's some part of me that just, um, I either don't work well in this normal life, or I need kind of this extreme, I don't know, some extreme goal. And I don't know, I don't know what, what it is, but yeah, it was, I, I tried and it just didn't work. And finally I just kind of had to throw my hands up and say, well, let's, um, let's go do another one because that's the only thing that seems exciting and worth doing. Now, Quasi, there's a movie in this somewhere. I, I, I just see this movie playing out before me as you're telling me these stories and your experiences. And my, my advice to the director would be for those scenes that uh, you're in the accounting office, those are, those are in black and white. Those are black and white scenes. And when you step foot on the trail, it is vibrant technicolor. Everything, it's just all the colors popping out. And that, that seems to be the, that's what you're describing. You know, the, the drab gray life of everyday monotony versus the, just the, the freedom and uh, experience out there on the trail being full. It really color. is. And that's, that's the language I use to describe it is it, I feel so much more vital and alive when I'm on trail and doing adventures versus in the office. I just feel dead and like life is muted and it's like depressed. Um, mm -hmm. Like that, that's the perfect term for it. Yeah. Now, did your accounting background uh, factor into the, any of the prepping that you did? I mean, you, are you a spreadsheet guy that, that meticulously plans out every detail of the hike as much as you can, or do you, do you more freewheel it? Yeah, no, I, I made a spreadsheet for the CDT, but that's the only time I've made a spreadsheet. And generally I don't plan past. I just plan to the next town stop. Like when I hopped on the AT, like I had no idea um, really about any of it. I just knew I needed what five days of food to get to Hawassi. And, and that's, that's generally like, that's how I'm going to plan next year um, as well. I just go to the next town and no, I'm definitely much more impulsive than a planner. And I, there's a lot of benefit to that because there's so many spontaneous things on trail, um, where if you had to try to stick to some plan you'd miss out on a lot of it. Yeah. And I think that, uh, it's frustrating for those type a personalities who want to plan every minute because that's impossible on the trail. That's uh, like Mike Tyson said, and my list, my regular listeners get tired of hearing me say this, but uh, everybody has a game plan until you get punched in the mouth. And then, you, then, you, <laughs> then it goes out the window. You gotta, you gotta be spontaneous. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's a great trait to have on the trail and probably a trait that gets developed because you kind of learn that like humans are so infinitely adaptable and like you can just, whatever arises, you can figure it out. Right. Now, AT was 2016. Fast forward two years later, you, you decided to take on the CDT. Yes. How did your, how did your planning and your packing evolve from, uh, during those two years? Um, so I knew I needed to go lighter. So I definitely went much lighter on the CDT and that year. Yeah. So I tried to go, uh, I was originally planning to hike the Arizona trail and then hike the CDT southbound. And then that turned into, um, like, well, I can just bike the Arizona trail and then bike all the way up to Montana. And then I can hike down and, and turn it into a, you know, traverse the country twice, once on bike and once on foot. And that's what I ended up doing. I biked the Arizona trail. It took 33 days. It honestly, some of the worst experiences of my life. Just so one day we, I was pushing, pushing my bike up the muggy on rim. So that's, you're going from about 2000 feet to about 8,000 feet up to where Flagstaff is. And there was a down tree, like for hiking, it wouldn't have been a big deal at all. There was a down tree, maybe every, you know, quarter of a mile. But when you have a hundred pound loaded bike with you, you have to like, you know, haul that bike over the tree or push it under somehow. And it took me, um, I think it took me 12 hours to go nine miles up that muggy on rim. And like, that wasn't that, like, that was a really bad day, but 
all the other days were maybe, I don't know, 20% less bad. <laughs> that was how bad that thing was with a stupid bike. Um, so I did that. And then I was just so tired and so burnt out on it. I was like, well, I'm not going to ride the hard routes up to Montana. I'm just going to go ride by the Pacific ocean and ride that up to Canada. And so I just rode highway one, just this nice, smooth, flat highway, uh, of the Pacific ocean up to Canada and then hopped over to the CDT from there. Quadzi, I don't think you're converting anybody from, from, uh, from backpacking to bike packing with, with that description. No. And I honestly, yeah, I don't, there is nothing good, <laughs> nothing good about bikepacking over backpacking because you don't get to go to wilderness areas. Uh, but no, there is one good thing. Like you can go to all the restaurants you want to go to because it's so easy to get somewhere on a bike. So that's the one positive, but you, you miss out on the community too, because everyone is so much more mobile on a bike. You're not restricted to this two foot path. Like you don't see people nearly as much. And if you see somebody, you know, they could go 150 miles the next day and you'll never see them again. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm much, I'm a backpacking stuff. So I don't even own a bike now anymore. <laughs> well, after that experience and after your grand Canyon experience, I, I can't imagine why not. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No backpacking is the way to go. Yeah. So then I hopped up there in glacier and uh, started heading, heading South. Yeah. And there are a lot of alternate routes with the CDT. I think, uh, the longest path would be 3,100 miles. Uh, what, what was your path? Do you, do you remember, remember how, how long it was and how long it took you? Yeah. So it probably ended up being 25, 2,600 miles for me. So we took the big sky cutoff because mm -hmm. I started fairly late. I, I don't know. I tend to start trails really late. So I started in July and you really need to make time because you're trying to get through the San Juans by the end of September. And so the big sky cutoff cuts off like 200 miles and it's a really pretty cutoff. It, um, it goes from like Butte to big sky, Montana, and there's, um, all these high Alpine lakes, eight to 10,000 feet. And it honestly reminded me a lot of glacier. It was, um, you know, that high Alpine wilderness and it was all these wilderness areas. So I, I was a really big fan of that cutoff. Uh, we also took the Teton route which is an alternate and went up the Teton crest trail. Um, and the Tetons are just like a completely different world, different experience out there. Um, it, I've never been to Switzerland, but that's what I would imagine the Swiss Alps would look like. Um, it's just gorgeous. And that's kind of my, yeah, my memory of the whole CDT, just so many gorgeous wilderness experiences, um, went through down into the San Juan. So we were planning, um, on, so I was hiking with flyby and we had, um, been pretty good, like on the same page about everything. And we, we said like, okay, when we get through Colorado, if it's going to be a lot of weather, we're going to take the Creed cutoff. The Creed cutoff is a lower elevation route versus the, um, you know, the official route goes through the San Juans at like 12 to 13,000 feet all through there. And the, um, so when we get to that, decision point of, are we going to take Creed or are we going to take that cutoff? We had met some other hikers. We had a good trail family going and it was calling for five days of precipitation up, you know, in the mountains. And so if it were just fly by and I, it would have, we would have taken that Creed cutoff hundred percent, but we got kind of peer pressured into, you know, just following everybody else. We went into the San Juans and it was, um, it's probably the most dangerous experience I've had on trail because we had just like unrelenting freezing rain for um, several days in a row. And the most dangerous time I remember we were trying to push up and over this ridge that was at 12,000 feet. Um, we should have just camped at the bottom of that ridge. Like it was a nice valley, um, but we decided to push up and over and the sun is setting as I go over this ridge and I have... I'm wearing glasses at the time. So I got, you know, lakes a couple or this yeah, last year. So, but I had glasses at the time and they were freezing over with the rain. And I just, you know, had the little headlamp and like, like I can really not see because it's that combination of having freezing rain coming down. That's obscuring your vision. My glasses are frozen and, you know, just this little headlamp is also kind of frozen over and not really dispersing light very well. And I'm losing the trail like every five minutes. And I know there's a cliff on my left side. Uh, so I'm, I'm like being really careful not to fall off this cliff. And then I'm just trying to find the trail. So I, like I ended up just having my phone out uh, for probably half an hour and just you just using that little dot to navigate. <laughs> it's such a dumb way to navigate because, you know, um, but 
I finally end up seeing headlamps in the distance and it's my, it's flyby and, um, uh, the other people, hot legs didgeridoo that I was with camped out. And we just all ended up huddling under this one tarp and like boiling bottles of water that night to stay warm. Um, and it was, and the next day flyby and I, we both bailed off and went into Crete. And that was kind of an adventure too, because it was all we had. We didn't have like good maps of the area. All you could see was like on gut hooks. And maybe we had uh, an event or a guy, a map that had a little bit of what, like, it looked like there was a trail on there, uh, but there was no, no certainty. Like we didn't know, but we knew that it was storming and cold as hell on this mountain. So we said, let's go ahead and try it. And so we, um, yeah, came down and it was kind of an old burnt out trail and we had to like cross this river several times and we had to go through these farmers fields and like crawl under fences. And it was this whole thing to get to the highway to then hitch into Creed. Um, but that, that was, yeah, those, that's probably some of the most memorable times I've had on the trail, just because of how dangerous and how, you know, how different it was to have to figure it out. And to just, you know, like you just have this little map from gut hooks that's not detailed at all and like go into the gray area and hope that you can figure it out to get out from there you have just described the classic example of type two fun yes a lot of type two fun out there up, up in the be. san juans with your your glasses and the the headlamp and the, the the freezing rain and sleet not fun when it happened but you enjoy talking about it yes absolutely yeah that's it's the good stories don't come from when everything goes right. <laughs> That's right. That might be the title of this episode. I like that. That's good. <laughs> now, when you, when you started the CDT, did you have in your mind that, that this was going to be the second leg in your triple crown? Or uh, did you decide after the CDT that you were going to attempt the triple crown? Yeah, I had it. Yes. So after I did the AT, I just kind of knew that I was going to do all three. Okay. Um, and it wasn't a, ever a decision. And that was kind of weird too on the AT, even though I was in so much pain, I knew I was going to finish it. Like I had never really thought about quitting. And actually the only time I've ever thought about quitting was this year when I was going southbound on the PCT, when my feet were hurting so bad and it wasn't really quitting. It was just this thought of like, why am I out here? And then I realized, well, that's the first time I've ever asked that question. Uh, because I think the other trips, it felt like I didn't have a choice. It's like, I had to be out there. And I guess this trip, maybe I've proved to myself enough and the way I didn't feel like I needed to continue to be out there, but yeah, it was, it's kind of strange. These other trips where I, I was like, I didn't, I just had to finish. I had to go. There was no other alternative. Right now let's talk about the, the southbound attempt of the PCT. How much did you get in again? So I did Washington okay. and then, then I did the Oregon coast trail, about half of it with a friend. And then I went and hiked the Colorado trail and then I hiked New Mexico CDT to finish that out. So uh, in 2018, I actually got Giardia in um, Chama, New Mexico. So that was coming through those stretches up there in the San Juans. Like it was so cold, like we weren't even stopping to filter water. And I figured you know, all these water sources, 10, 11, 12,000 feet, they should be fine. Um, they weren't, <laughs> and I got really bad Giardia. Uh, nobody else got sick though. So, but, and nobody else was filtering. So I think I was already kind of immune compromised. Um, I so, kind of been fighting this flu for since Salida and man, yeah, just getting into, um, what was it? Chama. Like, I was like, oh, I don't feel right. And then that whole night I'm just starting to like, shit myself <laughs> that whole next day. So I'm really glad I didn't go because I didn't feel r too terrible yet uh, when everybody else went back on the mountain, but they got 10 inches of snow. And that was that day was when I started to get really sick and I couldn't even keep down water. So like I was dehydrated in the hotel room or the motel room in Chama, the $22 <laughs> a night motel in Chama. Uh, like I was already dehydrated just sitting there in that room. So if I had you, gone you didn't, back- You didn't stay in the Hyatt or the, the Hilton? Right. Yeah. The no. Hilton Ochama. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I always think like, man, that could have been the decision between life or death for me. That one simple decision of not going up, up on that mountain, because if I was dehydrated in this room, like how would I have walked out in 10 inches of snow up there? Um, so that, that ended up being a really good decision to stay. And I ended up losing like 16 pounds in two weeks. And it was, I just could not keep food or water down. 
Wow. Wow. That, that is, uh, sounds miserable actually. It, it, I, I've, I've luckily I've not experienced Giardia and I hope, I hope never to experience that, but some, from some of my, my guests, uh, and their stories of it, it just sounds, uh, like the worst. Yeah. I, I will never not filter water again. I've, <laughs> there's a hard learned lesson there. You filtering your tap water at home. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You probably should <laughs> these days. <laughs> All right. So you've got uh, most of, you, you did the Oregon Coast Trail, which is, is not an alternate on the PCT, right? That's uh... No, no. Yeah. The Oregon <laughs> Coast Trail is like a vacation. You're just hiking down. Uh, half of it is like Highway 1. The other half, you're walking on a beach. It's really cool. You get to see all mm-hmm. these wild, you know, um, there's just so much life. Um, all these crabs that are scuttling around. And I like the little, I think they're called plovers. They're just these little birds and they'll they like, they run super fast and you see their little legs just like running and then they get kind of confused. So they're trying to run away from you and the waves at the same time, and then also eat. And so they just run, 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 and they peck at the ground and then they like jump over the waves and they run some more. Uh, I don't know. They just, it was really cool to see all. Yeah. We saw some seals. Sounds sea like those, those, those sound like through hikers and that they're burning more calories than they're taking in. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it was cool. And you hit a town like twice a day. So you can have town. You don't, I don't think, I don't think we really carried food or water. You just didn't need to, or like filter water. You just carry water from town to town and you eat food when you get to town. And it's kind of like glamping like right there. Yeah. Yeah. Glamping, no, it really glamping. was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you've got all of Oregon to do and you've got all of California to do. Mm-hmm. That's okay. Right. All right. And we're going to talk about uh, your plans for that. But before we get to that, I want to talk to you a little bit about, um, a phenomenon known as post-trail depression. And I've talked to other hikers out there and asked them how it hits them. It, it kind of hits people different ways. Some people uh, doesn't impact a whole lot. Others just go into um, full-blown depression uh, after coming off the trail, after leaving that behind and then trying to enter the regular world again. And I'm interested to hear with your background and your bouts with, with depression growing up. I mean, how, how, did, how did this impact you? What kind of effect did it have? Yeah, it hits me really hard. And I think because I have, you know, a history of depression and it was probably a period of 10 years where I had a major depressive episode every winter for, you know, two to three months where I'm just uh, like not functioning at all. Um, And so for me coming back from trail, and it was, it was really bad after the AT, like I, it might've been six months before I felt any semblance of being alive again after the AT, um, in 2017. And, um, and it's, it was, um, so like progressively it's gotten less bad for me, but yeah, I I wanted to top touch on this topic because I think people have this idea and I had this idea that, you know, if I can do this really great thing and go hike the AT, then, then life will be okay. And then all my problems will be taken care of. Um, and it's not that way. It's like, you have all your same problems that you had before, but you have a little, little more tools in your toolbox. Um, and I think, you know, I've been really kind of diving into it this, um, this, you know, after this latest hike. And I think there's so many different factors that just all hit at once. Like one, you're losing your community, um, which is so important for, you know, happiness. And it's, if you're, um, you know, like me, like where I tend to kind of isolate and I didn't have a strong community back home, well, then you're leaving all your trail friends and family. And then you're coming back home to like, I just sit in my house all day by myself and do nothing. Um, and that makes it really hard losing that community. There's the physical aspect. I think your hormones are just, um, you know, it's, you're really crashing your testosterone balances. Um, there's, you get a huge hit of dopamine after you finish the trail, but then you have that corresponding crash along with it. And then your, you know, your physical body is just wrecked. So it just needs rest. So I think for me, it really, it's like, it's like the perfect wave where it just, um, knocks me into all of these really bad habits from when I was younger to where immediately I start to um, just, uh, wake up later, later, later. And then that makes me feel unproductive and that makes me feel bad. And then I don't want to be out because like my brain doesn't feel like it's even working correctly, but, um, thankfully 
I, uh, I, I attended a couple or I attended a meditation retreat after the AT. And then since then, I've gone to about one every year and kind of using those practices and dealing with um, learning how to deal with these emotions that come up and, and suffering and pain and all that and how to work with it has kind of really um, changed my relationship to depression. And so like this, this year after the trail, I definitely was depressed again, but it didn't have the same, um, didn't have the same kind of viciousness or the same level of suffering to it. It was more like, I knew I was tired and I knew this is what I'm going through, but I also know it's not going to last forever. And I know if I just do these certain things and like kind of give myself grace for, um, the, for it, that it will pass. And it's, I've been home for about a month now and like, I feel really good now. And I've, I really feel like myself again. And that's probably one of the quickest turnaround times for me of getting off trail, getting depressed and then coming back. And, and I really attribute that a lot to, um, just kind of these things that I've learned, which is like through the meditation is to be able to sit with the, um, the suffering and the pain that's arising and just knowing like, yeah, the first couple of weeks are just going to suck and, and that's okay. And just uh, allowing myself to sleep and like, I just need to sleep and for 12 hours and that's okay. Uh, and then, you know, as, as I get a little more energy, I start to, um, like this week I was able to go out and run uh, not far. I ran like two miles every day, but I went out and I ran and I felt so much better after that. And then I've been able to uh, clean up my diet and that's helped tremendously. So it's like, um, so I think that's, yeah, that's kind of what I would say is like it. I think probably, especially if you have a history of, um, depression, it's through hiking is going to hit all of those buttons for you, where it's going to knock out your social support system. It's going to, you know, your body is a wreck and you're just going to fall right back into your old habits, but know that you have a better toolbox that you aren't, you know, you're, cause that, that was what bothered me a lot when I was younger. I was like, man, am I just lazy and, and unmotivated? naturally as a person. And I just can't get anything done. Like, is like, that gave me so much psychic pain to think like, can I just not hold a job? Like, is this just, um, just a problem that I have, but, you know, just knowing like you, you can accomplish these big things, but you're, you've been hit with the perfect wave and you're going to be depressed for a bit, but you can come out of it and you have, you know, a better toolbox to deal with mm -hmm. it because yeah, the through hiking gives you so many great tools of pursuit perseverance and, you know, problem solving right, and all of that. Right. Recognizing that it's going to suck for a while. I mean, that's, yeah. uh, that, you can apply that to a hike, right? Absolutely. It, yeah. It, or, or a section of hike, this is going to suck, but you know, okay, yeah. just hang in there and uh, you're going to come out the other side. And maybe we should view it that way. Like your hike doesn't end at Katahdin or whatever your hike ends a month or two or three months afterwards. And you, you know, it's going to take that amount of time to readjust and settle and and let yourself heal before you feel normal again. Mm -hmm. That's right. Fantastic. That's that can't count as your, as your pro tip though. So don't, <laughs> okay. don't think you're getting off that easy. <laughs> All right. Now you, you spoke earlier about carrying a bunch of camera gear. Do you have a, uh, a documentary in the works? Yeah, I had, I've always planned that was when I did the AT. I was like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to hike the AT and I'll make a documentary about it. So I carried a, a Canon, you know, a 70 D uh, DSLR. And then with the, so it's like every trip I take, I have all these aspirations of making a documentary. And it's every time I look back on the footage, like, well, this is just 90% really bad. So I'm hoping maybe with this latest one, I've learned enough, you know, I've definitely learned, you know, how to do it better with the different shots I need. So I, I would like to put together a, a documentary after the latest, um, after the uh, next year, do encounter year, triple crown next year, um, uh, make a documentary about that. And I think hopefully maybe all the stars can align this time where I know the shots I need to take and not just have a thousand landscape shots with no, you know, no context in them. Um, yeah. And that's, that was always uh, a dream of mine. Like I would just, it would be fun to be like an Anthony Bourdain, but you know, with nature and, ex and athleticism and right. some spiritual stuff thrown in and nice. Nice. Now, before we get to the calendar, your triple crown, uh, let's talk a little bit about your YouTube channel. What uh, you talked earlier about the, the healthy gamer has, has your YouTube evolved from the healthy gamer to something else? Yeah. So I, I haven't done much with it lately, but mm -hmm. um, they started off doing where I was just making uh, work like video or playing video games and then incorporating some fitness elements into it. Right. And 
Um, and that was how I got into learning how to do video and all of that. But yeah, it's, I think eventually I would like to put out more hiking content. It's just been a time thing. And, and I think what I struggle with is figuring out the story to tell, because that's what I've learned is, is just the story itself of just walking 2000 miles is actually not that interesting. It's about, you know, the people and the relationships and, um, what you learn along the way. And like, that's the real journey. And so I think trying to figure out like, what is the story? You've hit it right there. That's exactly it. What is the story? Cause I have found as I've talked to people, it's, it's not the hiking. It's not the hiking. You know, we love the hiking stories, but it's, this is a, this is, this is not a hiking podcast. This is a human interest podcast. The stories behind the people is just fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just the hiking is just the vehicle to get at that deep stuff you know, but exactly. yeah, that's, yeah, agreed. Okay. Now you spilled the beans a little bit early. You talked about the calendar year triple crown. So tell us about that. What, uh, we, we know what the calendar calendar year triple crown is because there've been 13 people who have done it. We've had four of them on the podcast and they've told us about their experiences. We've talked to uh, legend, uh, buzz and Woody and, uh, the episode has not aired yet, but we've, I've also talked to horsepower who, who just oh, okay. finished it. So, awesome. uh, we've heard their, their stories about trying to, or they, they did, they conquered all three long trails in one calendar year, uh, which puts them in a very elite company. I mean, more people have been on the moon than have completed the calendar year triple crown. So it's, it's quite an accomplishment. Uh, what, what's your, what's your inspiration? What's your motivation for doing the calendar year? Yeah. So actually legend and prodigy are uh, two inspirations. So I've, um, you know, I, I met legend in 2018. He was, that was when he was finishing up his great Western loop. So we uh, just all met in Chama. He was like our whole gang of hikers. And then there's this other guy in a tiger shirt. It's like, Oh, that looks like a through hiker. And let's invite him to come hang out with us. And, and that ended up being legend. And I think that was his first zero since he has started hiking in April. This was October. <laughs> there in Chama. Yeah. And, and, uh, but yeah, I, I actually didn't, uh, end up figure, learning what he was doing until later on when somebody else, cause I was just so sick and out of it. And they're like, dude, do you know what he's doing? He he's just hiked like 7,000 miles this year. Um, so that was cool to meet him. I met prodigy, uh, people kept, so prodigy, um, uh, is another Asian hiker. He I think he was the first, uh, like person of color hiker to finish the calendar year triple. And this year at, um, at trail days, I ended up getting to Cascade locks right at PCT trail days and people kept mistaking, me for him and then him for me because we're both asian with long hair like we don't look alike at all but uh that was you know i had had known him through instagram and it was nice to meet him and talk with him so it's it's cool to like meet these and talk with these two guys um in real life and to i think that was kind of a realization like well they're just normal people as well um you know so like that that made it possible in my mind um and and then yeah, just the more I thought about it, it's just really exciting. And it gives me a lot of um, nerves and anxiety. Like I've woken up a couple nights now. I don't know why it's always right when I wake up that it feels like I feel all the anxiety from it. Like, oh my God, how am I going to hike, you know, all three trails in one year? But I think, I think that's a good thing because I think doing those things that give you nerves um, are the things where you're going to grow, where I think if I were like this year, just to plan on, you know, it's so funny to think like just hike the PC through hike the PCT. Like that's a pretty big thing by itself, but it would, um, I would, you know, I, it wouldn't, it wouldn't force me to have the kind of discipline and focus and, um, and push myself like I'll have to do if I want to complete this calendar year triple crown. And that's, I think that's what really draws me to it because I think that's, I feel like there's still something left to discover within myself. And that's this path of just doing like really pushing the envelope um, and to be able to do this crazy, you know, calendar year triple, I think that'd be really cool. And it's, it's going to give an opportunity to um, like, I'm going to use it to raise awareness uh, for these two organizations, veterans and fire and grassroots wildland firefighters. Cause uh, for my work, on the shot crew uh, last year, like I really saw like how hard that work is, how dangerous it is. And, um, like these guys, all the seasonal employees, they're getting about 15 bucks an hour, uh, to risk their lives. And like, we're, 
we got to do better than that for people who are out there saving the public lands. Really, that's the only line of defense from all these lands getting burned down and it's just getting worse. Those are two great causes. Tell us about the logistics for your calendar year. What, uh, where are you going to start? Are you going to go northbound, southbound, and then take us, take us through what, what the plan is? Yeah, so I'm going to start hopefully around the beginning of February on the AT in Georgia, and then just take that north as far as weather will allow. So, uh, you know, it'll probably be somewhere around Harper's Ferry or maybe Pennsylvania, I would imagine. Uh, probably won't be able to get into Vermont with the snow. So just take that and then hop over to the CDT, do New Mexico, and then hop over to the PCT. So this would probably be around, you know, middle of May when I hop on the PCT and just take that north, hopefully do that in under 90 days, hop back over to the CDT, do that southbound. Um, so, you know, probably another 70 days to do that back to New Mexico and then hop over to the AT and then do that, you know, south until it's, wherever, wherever I ended up. Okay. Now you say start the PCT in May. How long does it take you to get from the Mexican border to the Sierras? So that's 700 miles. So, you know, I'm probably mileage wise, I'll be looking at like 30 will probably be kind of what I shoot for. And then if the terrain is nice, like New Mexico, whatever, bump that up to 35, 40, or if it's you know, um, a lot of elevation gain and loss like Washington or Colorado or Montana that would probably be look at more 25, 28 miles a day and just kind of play that out. So this, with those 700 desert miles, that'll probably be, I would imagine hopefully 20, 25 days, okay. something like that. So if you start in May, that means you're going to hit the Sierras in June, right? Beginning right. of June. And there's been 200 feet of snow in the Sierras. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Well, and, and it, I think it'll just really depend if it's a bunch of snow, I'll probably flip up to Oregon border and then take that South. That's what I was going to, I was going to ask. Yeah. 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 So I'm not, I think, yeah, I'm definitely not opposed to doing as many weird little flips as I can just to try and keep the mileage up and not get bogged down in weather. And yeah, hearing the stories of people in those high snow years in the series is really pretty scary. Like we're talking about fear mongering, but some of those is like legitimate fear. Like you shouldn't be there. <laughs> yes. Now I'm curious. I don't know the answer to this. Has anybody done the calendar year triple crown with the full trail, you know, sequentially they do the AT, the full trail, of the AT do the full trail of the, the CDT and then the full trail of the, of the PCT or, or any variation thereof. I think didn't legend do that. Because he did the full AT in from like February to April, which is crazy. But I think he did. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to ask him next time he's on. Because <laughs> yeah. I the, the the people that I've recently spoken to have had to do exactly what you're saying. They've had they've encountered, you know, just impassable conditions and had to to flip flop one way or the other or or take another take another portion of another trail. Yeah, and I think that's like that. You know, you're talking about the the sane versus insane backpackers. Like the sane way to do it is to bounce around to where there's good weather and not try to fight through snow. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't, I don't know that I would classify Legend as a sane person. I was just going to say you're does. calling Legend insane, which you know he <laughs> he would probably agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm hoping that's my plan. Like I, I, I have no um, desire to hike in a bunch of bad weather. I want to hit the good weather and go fast. That's the plan. Well, we wish you the best of luck and I want to get a commitment from you right now that you come back on the podcast and tell us about your experience. Yeah. Heck yeah. That sounds fun. Okay. Fantastic. Hey, Quadzilla, you know where we are? Are we at the pro tip? Oh, I didn't surprise you. You knew you, you're a regular <laughs> listener. That's right. We are at that time of the episode where I ask you for your pro tip inside of the week. What bit of wisdom trail wisdom can you share with our listeners to make their next outdoor experience even better? So the coolest thing or I don't know, one of the most useful things I learned this year on the CDT, it was either from guy or 50 cal, but like their technique to blowing up their air mattress. So it's much faster to do short, fast breath. So you're just like, (laughs) so if, if you do that, your mattress blows up much faster. And, um, yeah, that was like a huge life hack for me because I feel like through hiking, you're just spending your whole time, just blowing up that stupid sleeping mat at the end of the day. (laughs) <laughs> and I imagine if you do it that way at altitude, you probably get a pretty good buzz. Uh, yeah, yeah. Doing that too. So you should probably sit down when you're doing that. 
that's, two pro, is. that's two pro tips in one right there. Very good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So there you have it. That's it. This episode is just about in the books. Hope our listeners in ti- enjoyed our time with Quadzilla. I want to thank you for joining us this week. Quadzi, how can our listeners keep up with you on social media and where can they find updates on your latest adventures? Yeah, the best place would be Instagram or TikTok. Uh, probably Instagram be better. And that's uh, Quadzilla Hikes, all one word, just Quadzilla Hikes. And I'll be posting up lots of stuff from calendar year triple next year. Okay. And you're on TikTok. Yeah, I just started it. And that was, yeah, listening to like Tick and Talk and how they did on the CDT. I was like, this is probably something that we should get on and see what happens. Yeah, you could blow up. I mean, they, they've got like 1.6 million listeners now or followers. It's so crazy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And that might be an easier way to get video out because I, I always try like every trail, I, I'll do a month of getting videos out and then it just becomes too overwhelming and I mm-hmm. stop. You know. I can understand that. Remember to check out the pod on social media as well. We're on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And if you have comments or clips and you want to share, you can send it to me at johnfreakamir at gmail.com. Quadzi, I'm also looking to you to share a recommendation for a book, a movie, documentary, some kind of adventure media to keep our listeners connected to the trail. Call this our adventure media recommendation. What do you have for us? Ooh, um, ooh, what comes to mind? Yeah, The Indifferent Stars Above. So that's a book about the Donner Party. So as we're talking about that record snow um, year in the Sierras, it's a really, really good book all about the Donner Party. And it's listening to that will make all your tribulations on trail seem like absolutely nothing wow the donner party that's another highlight there <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's so wild i listened to that and i'm like wow this is yeah i don't know what i'm complaining about <laughs> my life is great and before we wrap things up i've got one more segment for you called what have i not asked you that you're dying to tell us about what did, what did i miss oh man um oh we didn't talk about the ultra if you want to talk about that. So yeah, Let's two days it. after finishing the CDT this year, I ran a 106 mile ultra and won that thing. Um, and and that won was, it. And won it. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that was pretty nuts. Yeah. I was just hoping to finish, but um, I don't, I'm trying to think, I don't know that anyone's ever kind of run an ultra right after a through hike, but a, a through hiking prepares you really, really well for ultras, especially like longer form races. Yeah. You know, I did a 125 mile hike this summer and did a marathon like a month later. I was, I was, had my best marathon time ever. So nice. I, yeah. I agree with that. I think there's a lot of crossover. Yeah. I, I'm going to say that's some kind of record you set doing, doing the CDT and a 106 mile. Ultra. Yeah. It, yeah. I was in Cuba, New Mexico. It was actually on the CDT. So you ran 26 miles um, South of Cuba and turn around and you did that twice. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. So I've done that section like seven times now, so I don't ever need to do that section again. <laughs> <laughs> that is knocked out. Well, that is a wrap from the John Freaking Muir Studio. Any shout outs to friends and family, Quadzi? Oh, there's, yeah, just all the, I mean, if I said everyone, I would forget somebody. So that's just all right. the trail family from all the, I mean, that's the people make the trail and everybody. Yeah, I'm so excited to to be back on trail with trail friends again. Okay. Well, thank you for tuning in. Always remember the trail is the trail. It doesn't care if you want to go downhill. It doesn't care if it's almost dark and you're looking for a campsite. It doesn't even care if your glasses are iced over and your headlamp is not working quite as well as it should. The trail is the trail. Embrace the suck. (laughs) 